So I uh, mentioned earlier in the service that I've been away on a trip to Florida. Uh, Kathy and the girls and I went down. This is our first trip we went on without Asher. It was kind of sad, but uh, he's at university and doing really well there, so it was, uh, it was good. It was easier in some ways without Asher, just, you know, just the four of us. Um, sometimes it's easier to decide where you want to eat when there's a fewer number. We ate at Chick-fil-A five times while we were gone. <laughs> so I feel especially holy this morning. Um, no, I, but the thing about the, the trip down is I, I love my GPS navigator for a trip like that because it, it's, it, it's a, I'm not really sure how to get to where I'm going. But once I plug it into my phone, it just it shows me, it'll even tell me where to go and where to turn and that kind of thing. But the problem, and honestly, it's, it's mostly easy because you, get on, you, you cross the border, you get on Interstate 81, and then for the last half of it, you, or most of it, you get on Interstate 95, and it just takes you straight down. By the way, those aren't the speed limits. <laughs> I wish they were. Uh, there's a couple of spots, though, that's kind of tricky, where you, you get off the interstate, and you get, you know, and you, if you make the wrong turn, you're going to end up in Kansas or something. The problem is that before we went down, I checked to see how much is it going to cost me to use my phone in the States, and our particular um, carrier is going to charge us $12 a day per phone. So we're looking at like almost $400 to the time we were gone if we both had our phones turned on. So what we started doing was every time we pulled into a, uh, a grocery store or a McDonald's or anywhere that close by, we would get on their Wi-Fi and use it. And, and before I left, I would make sure I knew I had it plugged in. I was very careful to make sure that I had the, the, the GPS sorted before we got on the road. Because once you're on the road, you're out of luck. There's no way to do it. Now, I don't do this regularly. I'm not, you know, even if I'm going somewhere I don't know where I'm going, I, I'm not careful to make sure before I leave the house to plug it in. Because I know up in Canada, anytime I want, I can just, I can, as long as there's a signal, I can get online and I can figure out where I'm supposed to be going. I find we aren't very careful when the stakes are low. You know, there's, there's not high stakes when I'm just driving to work not high stakes, even if I'm going somewhere I don't know where I'm going, as long as I can get on a Wi-Fi and figure it out, the stakes are low. But the higher the stakes are, I forgot I was doing this. the higher the stakes are, the more careful we need to be to follow the instructions. The higher the stakes are, the more careful we need to be to follow the instructions. Now the instructions, they're, uh, they're often just the manufacturer's opinion. That's, that's my, my take on it. Uh, you know, you, you Sometimes I'll get something from Ikea and I'll just look at it and be like, I can figure this out. And then I make a mess of it. And then I check what they're saying I'm supposed to do. And then, you know, it takes me twice as long as it should have in the first place. But there's some times where I, even I can tell, you know, I've only got one shot at this. If I mess this up, I have to go buy a new one or something like that. And so I make very, very sure, I'm very careful to understand the instructions before I move forward. And sometimes, you know, I can, I can have the analysis paralysis thing where it's like, I, I don't know for sure, and so I'm not going to move forward on it. And sometimes I just need to move forward anyway, but uh, that's my own, my own little issue. God has clearly marked out the path that we're supposed to follow in order to please him. It's, it's really not difficult. I mean, the, the idea of being a Christian is not really all that difficult. You know, love God, love others, make disciples. That's, I mean, you can say it any different way you want to, but that's really what it comes down to. We say love, lead, equip. That's, that's our mission statement. And God's made it very clear on how to do that. And, and Jesus said, you know, if you love me, you will obey my command. And so it's pretty clear. And, and pleasing God is the most important thing. So we need to be careful. We need to be careful to make sure we're following God's instructions. We're doing a series called Walk the Walk. And this is the second half of Ephesians. So beginning of the year, we started the, the first half of Ephesians. But uh, I think I said this last time I was here, finishing off the first series. Paul kind of writes his, chap or his, his letter in two parts. And the first one is all about what I said was orthodoxy, thinking the right thing. So we called that series, you know, Hello, My Name Is. So I, wa I want to make sure we understand who we are in Jesus, that your identity comes not from anything else, but primarily it comes from who you are in Christ. 
And so that's orthodoxy, right thinking. The, the second part of the letter is about orthopraxy, right practice. Make sure you're doing the things that, that you're supposed to do. So inform your decisions by what God says, and then live out what God wants you to do. And before I left on vacation, I mentioned that I, mentioned I was going to be away for a couple of weeks, and I said that, that Brandon and Mark are going to be uh, preaching while I was gone. And then we had the, the two highest uh, attended services <laughs> since I've been here. Or pretty close to it anyway. Um, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to uh, Brandon and Mark. You guys, uh, I, from what I hear, did a great job. I haven't been able to hear the, the messages, I think, actually, because the power went out. Brandon's was just gone, so it's only those who were here can tell the tale of how great he did. But uh, Brandon talked about walking in unity in a lot of ways. You know, that, that's the first part of this, this series. It was about, you know, if we're talking about walking the walk, we need to make sure we're walking together. And Mark last week talked about walking differently. You know, we're not supposed to look like the rest of the world. We're supposed to stand out. We're supposed to be different. This week, we're going to talk about walking carefully, which is interesting because we just had that song, Be Careful, Little Eyes, What You See, and Hands, What You Do. Uh, that kind of falls in line with what this, this, part of the, the mess, or this part of the series is all about. So today, we're looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 21. And it starts with, Imitate God because you are his dear children. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. So when we first started the book of Ephesians, we talked about the fact that we have been uh, adopted into God's family. We are his children. Imitation is an interesting thing, because sometimes it can be really honoring. Other times it can be dishonoring, depending on how you do it. Sometimes it's just kind of silly. So a few years ago, when we, you know, we were at the height of the pandemic and church was, was closed and we were doing everything online, I would record my sermons ahead of time. And then I would show them, make sure they were available Sunday morning. And our family would sit down and we would watch the YouTube video of the message that, for that day. And I found out a couple things. One I kind of already knew. I, I tend to talk out of the side of my mouth. I have like a real John Cretchen thing going on. I, I, I don't know why I do it. I just, oh. The other thing I found is that I lick my lips a lot when I'm preaching. I just, you know, wet the whistle. I discovered this, not because I noticed it, but because my kids noticed it. <laughs> and my wife. And so every time I did it, they would go... <laughs> So we're watching this video of me preaching, and every once in a while you just hear this, and it was uh, imitating because they loved me so much, I think. But I did learn some, some tricks. First of all, I mean, I was doing the video so I could, you know, edit anytime I wanted to. So every time I'd lick my lips, I would just put the image on screen and, and hide it, so that stopped. The other thing is I started to, like, you know, put on lip chap and stuff before I, I preached and made sure I drank a lot so I, I wasn't having to lick my lips as much. But there's, that's silly imitation. You know, there, there's imitation that can be really um, offensive, making fun of people. But I think a lot of times they say imitation is this, the most sincere form of flattery. And that's what we're talking about here. Imitate God because you are his dear children. Have you ever, those of you who are parents, have you ever seen your kids doing things and re recognize where they got it from? And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's not good. Right, you think, oh, I do that. Uh, or if you don't have kids, have you ever seen yourself doing something that your parents did? And you think, wow, I am becoming my mom or I'm becoming my dad. In this case, that's what we want. We want to imitate God. We want to imitate Christ in everything we do. Think about who Jesus is, and we want to be just like him. Christians are like little Christs in certain ways, not every way, obviously. But we want to be like Jesus. We want to we want to mimic him, imitate him in every good way. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Now this is interesting for uh, a couple of ways because we we all we all understand aromas. We all understand, you know, unfortunately, unpleasant aromas. 
We all know what it means when you're driving down the highway and suddenly the vehicle's all four windows drop, pull down at the same time and someone's gasping out the window. You know what happened inside that van, right? There's no question. We were driving back from Florida this past week and two times, one was somewhere in South Carolina, the other one was like South uh, Pennsylvania, where it was just this horrendous smell. But I knew it wasn't coming from inside. I mean, it was so bad. It was like, this is some area that we're driving through. It's bad enough when the smell is coming from inside the van. When it's outside the van, what do you do? You can't roll down the window. I think you just, the law is you're allowed to drive as fast as humanly possible <laughs> to get through that area. At least that's what I told the police officer. No, I didn't get pulled over. But it's just, you know, you know what a bad smell is, but you also know what a good smell is. Like some of you might, like, I personally like the smell of perfume and cologne. Like, I, I enjoy that. Uh, I, don't, I don't drink coffee but I love the smell of coffee. Kathy gets this coffee from, uh, from Costco. Uh, vanilla hazelnut. I think we actually serve it here as well. I love the smell of it. I love it when it's being ground. I love it when it's being brewed. If it tasted the way it smelled, I would be addicted. But I love the smell of it. Another one for me was when I was a kid, the smell of melting butter which is, sounds weird, but I knew like, when that smell came down the stairs while we were watching cartoons on Saturday morning, that meant mom was making pancakes. So I would smell the smell of mel melting butter and I knew something good was going to come. So even now when I smell that, you know, butter in a fry pan, it's just it's a good smell. It's a pleasant aroma. But what's interesting here is that God loved us, or Jesus loved us, and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. I find that interesting because when you think of the sacrificial system, what were they doing? They were making burnt offerings. They were taking an animal and putting it up on the altar. That, that's, that's, the, that's the metaphor we're using here. That's the imagery we're using. When we think about Jesus sacrificing himself for us, the, the early readers for sure would have thought of this. Have you ever smelled meat being burnt, like really burnt to a crisp? It is not a pleasing aroma. And so how is this a pleasing aroma to God? I, I think what it is is that it's a metaphor not, not the fact that he sacrificed himself, that's true, but the aroma is a metaphor for obedience and love. That Jesus did this out of obedience and love. And that's what smells good to God. That's what God loves. And so what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to imitate, we're supposed to imitate God everything, in everything we do. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us out of obedience and love. And so we are supposed to imitate that. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Aren't you glad that we've got this figured out? That we never see anything in the news about God's people taking part in sexual immorality, impurity, or greed? Sadly, I feel like those are maybe the ones that are most common. That, that pastors around the country and, and national, internationally fall because of these ideas. Sexual morality, the, the Greek word for it is pornea, which is where we get the term pornography. But really, it's, it's any kind of sexual activity outside of God's ordained uh, rules. So any sexual relationship, whether it's online or in person, that is not between a man and a woman that are married is sexual immorality. Let there not, let, some translators say, don't even let there be a hint of sexual immorality among you. And church in the West, are, we are failing at this. We see too much of this happening. Sexual morality, impurity, the word there, uh, it's kind of like a dirtiness, but not so much like physically, but morally. And, and most often kind of connected as well to sex. Greed is what you think. It's greed. But think about how many times greed has caused people to fall, to, to, to fall in the area of sexual morality. You know, you have, a, you have a desire for more and it causes you to do things that you know you shouldn't do. It causes you to, to, to dirty yourself morally whether it's theft or, or who, who knows what else, simply because you're greedy for things. So Peter puts all these, uh, sorry, Paul puts all these ideas together. 
such sins have no place among God's people. He wants to make it very clear. This isn't, this isn't like, a, well, we shouldn't really do much of it. They have no place. Not even a hint of it should be seen among God's people. He goes on. He says, obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Any fans of the office here? Well, I'll be honest. I'm a fan. I, I liked watching the show. I thought it was funny. Even though I knew I shouldn't be laughing at some certain parts. You know, when he says, that's what she said, we know that's, that's coarse joking. That's the kind of thing that Paul's talking about here. Uh, it's, it's like the double entendre. It's the thing, it's a way, uh, it's, I think the actual translation is like loose talk. It's the way of saying, I'm going to turn anything I can, any turn of phrase, into this sexual misunderstanding. So these aren't for you. Dirty jokes, coarse jokes, you know, dirty talk. One rule of thumb is to ask yourself, would I be willing to repeat this joke if Jesus was with me? Or would I change up what I was going to talk about? Would I be willing to watch this show if Jesus was sitting beside me? And I'm, I'm talking to myself here as well. Okay. These aren't for you. Let's, instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Thankful, thankful for everything he's given us. We don't need to do all these things. We are, not, you know, we, we are free from having to do these things. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshipping the things of this world. That's pretty strong language. And does it scare anybody? Has anyone here ever been guilty of immorality, impurity, or greed? And, and Paul saying that those, that person will not inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God? I mean, if that's, that's true, I'm not going to heaven. And yet, it's in the Bible, and I know it's true, so we have to understand it correctly. And I think what he's saying here is that uh, anyone who is defined by this, anyone who lives a lifestyle of this, someone, not someone who has faltered once, not someone who's going to falter next week, it's someone who does this habitually and, and does this on a regular basis, and this is who you are. That person is not going to inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. A greedy person is an idolater. So anyone who puts anything ahead of, of God, that, that's, that's idolatry. I mean, we often think idolatry of like bowing down before some, some statue or something like that, but anything that takes God's place in your heart is idolatry. And so if you know you're not supposed to do something, but you do it anyway because you want it so much, you're greedy for it, just understand that that's, that's idolatry. You don't have to bow before an idol before a statue to be an idolater. You worship the things of this world. We need to understand that the things of this world are all temporary. I mean, I feel like I talk about this all the time. It, so, many, so many parts of scripture come back to this idea that, that this is all just a blip on, on the timeline of eternity. And why would we, why, would we, why in the world would we be willing to give up all of eternity for one little tiny moment right now? These are the things of this world, not things of God's world. So again, I, I want us to understand this is a very serious thing, but there's also grace in God's, God's world. You know, if, if you have sinned, it doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. The wages of sin is death, any sin, no matter what it is, but the gift of God is eternal life. So if you are immoral, if you are impure, if you are greedy, the only way into the kingdom of Christ is through God's grace. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. I've got this image up here of progressive Christianity because I feel like that's what happens with progressive Christianity. They, whether they realize it or not, I, I, don't, I don't even think they're, they're trying to, but, but what they're doing is they're diminishing this. They're trying to excuse these sins. They're trying to say, that, you know, it, we're, we're going to rely only on this one thing and... You know, God, God's grace will, will cover all your sins, so basically do whatever you want because we've got God's grace, which is not the right mentality. It's, yeah, God's grace will cover all our sins, so embrace that grace and don't do the things we're not supposed to do. We'll talk more, more of that in a moment here. 
But don't be fooled by those who try to excuse their sins. It's so easy to be fooled by this because it's what we want to hear, isn't it? Wouldn't you love to hear somebody telling you, yeah, it's okay. It's okay to do what the thing... You're greedy? That's okay. Don't worry about that. God, God's got that covered. Go ahead, be greedy. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you love to hear that story? Wouldn't you love to hear that message? Don't be fooled by it. And it's, it's especially dangerous for those who try to diminish this because the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Romans 1.18 says, God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Don't suppress the truth. If you know the truth, do your best to live out the truth. Don't suppress it. And certainly don't tell somebody else uh, a lie to make them feel better. We, we often talk about the idea of, of loving each other. Well, love somebody enough to tell them the truth. It says, don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. So again, it, this isn't don't do this so you can be saved, but it's you are saved, so don't do this. You know, you used to be like this. You used to be people of darkness, but you have something better now. You have light. So don't live in the darkness anymore. Live in the light. And in fact, reflect that light. We're not the producers of the light. God is the producer of the light. He, he shines it on us, and we reflect it into dark places. Like that's, that's our call, to go into the world and make disciples. That's, that's what we're called to do. And we get to the idea of, of being careful. This is where this, this message's theme comes from. Verse 10. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. I mean, I said earlier, you know, we need to be very careful to make sure we follow the instructions when the stakes are high. Pleasing God, that's the highest stakes. So we need to be very careful to understand how to do that. Hebrews 11 talks about this. It says, it is impossible to please God without faith. If we want to please God, we need to know this. It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So it starts with faith. It starts with putting your faith in God and in God's word, but it's also about understanding in God's word how to, how to please him. God said, Jesus said, you know, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Well, what are his commands? How do we find that out? Where do we find it? You look in God's word. You read your Bible. You understand what God gave you as, you know, sometimes people refer to it as the instruction manual for life. Uh, we need to understand what God has said to us in his word so we know how to please him, so we know how to obey his commands and show our love for him. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in, spe- in secret. So how does that make sense? You know, we're supposed to expose the darkness, but it's shameful to talk about the darkness. I, I think what Paul is trying to say here is, you know, we need to expose, we need to talk about it, but don't talk about it to glorify it. It's understand that it is shameful, but we need to discuss it in order to help people understand how shameful it really is. Bring the stuff that is dark, bring it into the light. Their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. I, I searched online and through the Bible trying to figure out, you know, what passage is this talking about? When, when Paul quotes somebody, he's usually quoting a passage from the Old Testament. And I looked it up and I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it online. Most people think that this is probably like an early hymn. So earlier in the message, I talked about be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little hands what you do. That's not, I mean, the, thematically it's in Scripture, but you're not going to see those words exactly in Scripture. But this is probably what's happening here. Paul is probably quoting one of the songs that they sang at the time. Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. You used to be people of darkness, but now that you've come to Christ in the light, you are risen from the dead. And that's what he's talking about here. Now, it's interesting here. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. He doesn't say, don't, don't take part with people. Don't, it says, uh, how do I say this? Don't avoid people, but avoid the practice. So 
So we are called to go into the, into the world. We are called to go into these dark places and shed light on them, expose them, which means that we don't, you know, isolate ourselves and say, well, we're just going to live in our Christian bubble and not let anybody else in. You know, we are to go into the world, but we also need to use wisdom with that. We need to use wisdom how we do that. Because you are not to participate. Don't take part in the worthless deeds. Love the people, but don't take part in what they're doing. And again, be careful. Be careful how you live. Paul talks in, throughout this whole passage, he gives us a bunch of do's and a bunch of don'ts. You know, don't do this, instead do this. Don't do this, instead do this. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. So I'm going to go back to the office here. Okay? Uh, again, I was a fan of the show. There's certain parts that I shouldn't have laughed at, even though I probably did laugh at it. There's a quote from Dwight. You know, he says, you know, what's, what's the greatest advice he was ever given? Before I do anything, I ask myself, would an idiot do that? If the answer is yes, I do not do that thing. It seems like a silly quote, and yet it actually makes a lot of sense. You know, don't be an idiot. Ask yourself, is this something an idiot would do? I think, and I'm, again, I'm speaking to myself here because this is, uh, this is something I need to be more mindful of. Think through what's happening. Be careful about how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Is there anybody here, anybody in the world who would choose to live like, live like a fool over someone who is wise? If you gave them the option, would you rather be a fool or someone who is wise? I think almost everybody would say they'd, they'd rather be wise. And yet the world is full of fools. So why, why is that? Because we don't stop to think about it. We don't take the, the time to consider our actions. We just sort of go and live our life. Be careful. Be mindful. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the, war, what the Lord wants you to do. So again, we've got some don't do's and some to do's. We're to make the most of every opportunity. Uh, I, I, I looked up some commentary on this as well, and they said, you know, there's, there's different ways of talking about time. And there's, there's some, uh, some language that refers to, you know, the, the, the seconds, the minutes, the days, the hour time all-encompassing. Other parts of it is a little more nuanced. It's, it's talking about a specific time. And that's what Paul is using here. That's the language he's using here. Make the most of this specific time. And so um, I, I put up this, this. Don't confuse being busy with being productive. A rocking horse moves but doesn't get anywhere. So this isn't about just being busy. It's about being busy with a specific reason. Being busy for Jesus. D.L. Moody uh, famous theologian, said, our greatest fear should not be a failure, but of succeeding at something that doesn't really matter. So does this mean that you can't ever read a fiction book? Does this mean you can't watch a TV show? You know, you need to make the most out of every opportunity? Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go that far. Maybe that's up to you to decide. I think it's the Holy Spirit's going to inform you what this time is for you. But make the most of it. And again, a large part of this time is a tiny little bit on eternity. So make the most out of the time you have here because eternity is coming. It says, don't be drunk with wine. Again, do's and don'ts. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your hearts, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I was looking up how many verses talk about drinking in the Bible. And there's quite a few. And it's, I wouldn't say it's 50-50, but there are some that talk positively about drinking. You know, like, like wine is good for your heart. Paul writes to Timothy and says, you know, I want you to drink a little bit of wine rather than just water because of how sick you are. Part of it is about the purity, uh, purification that comes from the, the process of making wine. But there's a lot in the Bible also that talks about alcohol being a negative. And I think we see that in our culture. I, in my opinion, I see more negatives than positives when it comes to alcohol. So, I'm not up here as a teetotaler telling you thou shalt not ever have alcohol pass your lips. But Paul is clearly saying, don't be drunk with wine. I would also add rum, vodka, whiskey, you know. <laughs> and let's take it a step further. Marijuana. 
right? I mean, that's, that's legal in our world right now. I, I think if Paul was writing to us today, he'd probably say, don't get high. Because, why? Not because he's a, <laughs> a killjoy, but because it'll ruin your life. So yeah, if you want to go home and have a, a little red wine with your steak tonight, well, inv- invite me over, first of all, if you're having steak, that'd be great. <laughs> But don't, like, drink three bottles, right? Have a little bit. Don't ruin your life. And instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he's using this idea of, you know, the, the spirits, the liquids, sometimes they're referred to as spirits, and then the Holy Spirit. Don't fill yourself up with this thing that's going to ruin your life. Instead, fill yourself up, be filled with this thing that will make your life better. Not thing, this person. The Holy Spirit. And, and the words here are uh, interesting. Like, it wouldn't make sense in English, but be being filled continuously. Like, this is like a, an ongoing thing. This isn't a one-time thing. Like, okay, I became a Christian. I got the Spirit. I'm done. No, this is, this is a continual thing. And anytime I talk about being filled with the Spirit, I, I l- use language that I learned, which is not that the Spirit gets more of you, but you, uh, sorry, not that, the, not that you get more of the Spirit, but the Spirit gets more of you. So it's, it's being filled with the Spirit is surrendering yourself over and over and over again to the Spirit's will in your life and saying, I want you to be in the driver's seat. I want you to lead my life. That's, that's being filled with the Holy Spirit. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, uh, commentators say we're not really sure what the difference is of this. Simply, it's a variety. Just when you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to want to worship. You're going to want to worship God. Making music to the Lord in your hearts. I think for some of us, this is the only way we're going to make a joyful, joyful noise is in our hearts. For some of you, you've been blessed in other ways. But, you know, some of us, it's in my heart. It's the only way it sounds good. But give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It always comes back to Christ. I mean, your identity is in Jesus. Your freedom is in Jesus. Your worship should be based on Jesus. Another thing about this idea of being filled, uh, this is a commentary I read. It says, the ancient Greek, the first, the verb is passive, so this is not a manufactured experience. This isn't something you make happen. It is, it is just like a willingness to surrender and let God do what he wants to do. Second is that it's imperative, which means it's not optional. This isn't like if you feel like it. This is, this is God's message to you. Surrender your will to the Holy Spirit in every area of your life. So when we talk about sexual immorality, you know, a lot of people get hung up. A lot of people in our world today get hung up on that. It's like sex has become the most important thing. Well, are you willing to surrender even that to God's will? For some of you, it may not be sexual immorality, it may be greed. Are you willing to surrender that part of your life to God? No matter what it is, what is the idol that's in your way? Are you willing to lay that down and worship God? So be careful how you live. That's the theme today. If you don't remember anything else, be careful how you live. Be mindful about following God's instructions, which means read God's word. You need to be in God's word to know what it is that you're supposed to do. Second part is surrender every part of yourself. Get rid of that idol. And I don't know what it is for you. It's going to be different for all of us, but what's the thing? What's the, what's the one thing, the main thing right now, the biggest thing that's keeping you from surrendering your will to God? Get rid of it. Surrender that part of it. Say Say, the eternity with Jesus is way more important to me than this thing is to me right now. Make that decision. And then there'll probably be something else that becomes the biggest thing. And then surrender that. And surrender saying, not my will, but yours be done. There are no higher stakes than that of pleasing God. And as Christians, we are called to put that above everything else. We're going to ask our prayer team to come up.